It is my privilege to introduce as the 2013 commencement speaker at Concordia College, Roxana Sabiri, a journalist, an author, and human rights advocate. Summa cum laude graduate of Concordia College in 1997 with majors in communications and French, varsity soccer player who as a student volunteered as a coach in a nursing home, in a homeless shelter, and with a refugee resettlement program, who has since earned degrees in journalism at Northwestern University and in international relations from Cambridge. She grew up in Fargo, father of Reza Sabiri, who was born in Iran, and Akiko Sabiri, who is from Japan. In 2003, Roxana moved to Iran to pursue her career and her cultural interest. She regularly reported for the BBC and for National Public Radio. In late January 2009, she was arrested and later convicted on manufactured espionage charges and sentenced to eight years in prison. Her book about that experience, Between Two Worlds, My Life in Captivity in Iran, was published by HarperCollins in 2010. Roxana has since traveled across the United States into Europe, South America, and the Middle East to speak with the public, media, and government officials about human rights violations in Iran. Her articles have been published by the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, CNN.com, the Daily Beast, and the Chicago Tribune. She has been interviewed on television and radio networks and on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. <laughs> My dream. <laughs> she is currently working on her second book about Iran. Roxana has received the Medill Medal of Courage, the Ilaria Alpi Freedom of the Press Award, the NCAA Award of Valor, a Project for Middle East Democracy Award, and an East-West Freedom Award from the Levantine Cultural Center. She was named one of the United States JC's 2011 10 Outstanding Young Americans and was honored by the Japanese American Citizens League as an outstanding woman. And she was chosen as a commended artist for the Freedom to Create main prize. She just arrived here from Boston, where she spoke at a World Press Freedom Day event. And tomorrow, she'll be heading to Washington, DC to participate as a panelist in the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace panel discussing Iran's imprisonment of the seven leaders of the Baha'i faith there. Please join me in welcoming home Roxana Sabiri. Thank you, President Kraft, for that generous introduction. President Kraft, Chairman Tanheim, faculty and staff, families, friends, students, and most importantly, graduates. It's a thrill to finally be your commencement speaker. I apologize I couldn't make it in 2009 when I was first invited, but I was stuck in a prison in Iran. If not for the support of the Con Concordia community, other friends, and even total strangers around the world, I might still be in Evan prison today, instead of here at Concordia, where my adult life began. I was asked to talk to you about what Concordia taught me as I set out into the world, and how this might benefit you. I think the best way for me to do this is to tell you about how I've been affected by Concordia's mission to influence the affairs of the world by sending into society thoughtful and informed men and women. This mission has guided me through the years, though the way I've defined it has evolved. I didn't know about the mission the first time I set foot on campus. I came here to take piano lessons from the late Inta Stahl. I was just a scrawny 11-year-old, yet the grown-up students always said hello to me with the warmest smiles. 
Six years later, as a freshman at Concordia, I learned that it was cool to be nice. <laughs> and I still feel that today. Everybody here is just so friendly whenever I come back to campus. I also learned the importance of being well-rounded. And I don't mean by gaining the freshman 15. <laughs> like many of you, I worked hard and played hard. I played soccer, continued piano lessons with Jay Hirschberger. Jay, are you here? Can't see you, but <laughs> oh, he's back there. Reported for Concordia On Air with Don Rice and the late Rusty Castleton, and worked at the Campus TV Center with the late Dean Olson. And through my classes for the first time, I began to reflect deeply on the purpose and meaning of life. As students here at Concordia, you've probably read books that have made you contemplate the meaning of your lives. One book I read as a freshman was Man's Search for Meaning. How many of you have read it? Wonderful. In this book, Viktor Frankl wrote that our greatest task is to find meaning in life. He saw three possible sources of meaning. One, in work or doing a deed. Two, in love and three, in unavoidable suffering. I didn't expect to find meaning in love or unavoidable suffering anytime soon, so I longed to find meaning through my work by devoting myself to a cause to serve humanity, and this, I believed, would be in line with Concordia's mission to influence the affairs of the world. What paths have you chosen to influence the world? Business, communications, education, healthcare, music, many other different fields. The path I chose was journalism. To make my mark on the world, I thought I had to make a difference on a large scale, not on a small one. So I dreamed of becoming a foreign news correspondent. When I was sitting where you are today, I was planning to embark on an internship at the NBC News Channel in North Carolina. But plans often change, and these changes can be opportunities. About a month after I graduated, I somehow became Miss North Dakota. I hadn't been planning on that at all. And with scholarships from the Miss America program, I was able to go on to graduate school. Then, after I graduated, I was still determined to become a foreign news correspondent, so I applied for jobs at BBC and CNN overseas. Needless to say, I didn't even get an interview. Instead, my first full-time reporting job was here, in my hometown of Fargo. Now, I love Fargo, but those first couple of months, I felt sorry for myself. I was supposed to be influencing the affairs of the world, not reporting on potholes and blizzards. <laughs> I snapped out of it, though, when I realized I had a lot to appreciate right here in Fargo-Moorhead. I had caring and talented colleagues, responsibilities I wouldn't have had in bigger cities, and the chance to contribute to my community. I learned I could find meaning in my work wherever it took me if I had the right attitude. Three years later, in 2003, I had the chance to work as a journalist in my father's native land of Iran. Some friends and colleagues advised me not to go, but I was sure that reporting from Iran would help me better influence the affairs of the world, and my heart was telling me to go for it. What's your heart telling you? Will you have the courage to follow it? When you follow your heart, you may encounter opposition, even from those who care about you. You will face difficulties, but you will also find fulfillment. That's what happened to me. I moved to Iran, and I loved reporting there. But after three and a half years, the Iranian government pulled my press pass without any explanation. All of a sudden, I lost my identity and my purpose. If I wasn't a foreign news correspondent, who was I? If I couldn't report from Iran, how could I help influence the affairs of the world? Eventually, I realized, though one road was blocked, I could choose another. So I decided to write a book about Iran. And as I was working on it, Concordia's then president, Pamela Jolicoeur, invited me to be the commencement speaker at the 2009 graduation. Over the following months, I tried to find words of wisdom to share with the graduates. On January 24, 2009, I wrote these ideas in my diary. One, listen to your heart your conscience. Usually what they tell you is right. Two, no one can take knowledge away from you. It's always worth investing in. Three, 
find an identity that's separate from work, from another person, and from material things. So if you lose those things, you won't lose yourself, too. I admit I was struggling to follow this advice myself. At times, I was filled with what they call in Farsi, puchi, absurdity, or lack of meaning. And then I'd think, how can I inspire graduates to find their way when I feel so lost? These thoughts troubled me one night, a few nights later. As I was drifting asleep, I asked myself what I'd do next with my life, where I'd live, whom I'd be with, whether anyone would ever read the book I was writing. And then I'd wonder, but does any of this really matter? No, in fact, nothing really matters. I'd started to think that despite my efforts, my life didn't have much meaning, and I was tired of striving to give it meaning. In the end, we all die anyway. I couldn't recall why I'd ever been so resolved to make a difference in the world. The next morning, on January 31st, 2009, I was arrested. And that afternoon, I was locked up in solitary confinement in Tehran's Evin prison. My captors said I was interviewing too many people simply to be writing a book about Iran. They claimed it was a cover for espionage for the CIA. They said if I didn't confess to spying, I could stay in prison for 20 years or even get the death penalty. I hope you will never be imprisoned, or haven't been imprisoned already. But we will all have our own prisons, situations in which we feel trapped, like we can't break free from what's happening to us. And these prisons come in different forms, a broken heart, an illness, the loss of a job, the suffering of a loved one, feeling hurt by others. How will you break free from your prisons? Me? I prayed hard. I got down on my knees in that cell, pressed my forehead to the cement floor, and said, God, when I spoke to you last night, I was just kidding. <laughs> I really do want to live. Please save me. Later, I tried bargaining with him. God, if I get out of here soon, I'll abandon journalism and writing, and I'll never interview anyone ever again. At other times, I was angry. Angry at myself, anger, angry at tensions between the US and Iran, and angry at God. God, I said, I was just trying to serve society. Why are you punishing me? After many tears, I finally reached the first step in truly dealing with adversity, acceptance. I had to accept that I couldn't change my past or my present situation. No one knew where I was, and as much as I wished that an earthquake would split open those prison walls and let me free, there was no escape. All I had was my faith and the power to control my attitude. Bad things happen to all of us. What matters most is how we deal with them. I was reminded of this lesson by my cellmates, women being punished for peacefully exercising their basic human rights. They made the most of their time in prison. They exercised in place in their cells every day, discussed books they were allowed to read, and asked me to teach them English phrases to use for shopping, traveling, and of course, swearing. <laughs> I was also reminded of the power of attitude by a book that one cellmate had. Do you know which book? Man's Search for Meaning. It was translated into Persian. When I reread it in my cell, I found new meaning in the words of Frankel, a Holocaust survivor. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. By choosing our attitude, we can find meaning in our prisons, our adversities, and turn them into opportunities to grow and even to help others. When I was in prison, it was extremely difficult to grasp this idea. How could I ever find meaning in being locked up against my will and charged with a crime I didn't commit? But gradually, I found meaning through the lessons I learned. My father taught me one of these lessons. One day, my captors allowed me to call him in Fargo, and he told me, Roxana, just remember, they can never hurt your soul. He meant that others may harm us with their words and actions, but they cannot harm our souls, our essence, that deep, unchanging stillness within us, the joy of being, the peace of God. The Bible says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, 
but cannot kill the soul. I whispered those words to myself whenever I was taken to the interrogation room blindfolded, and they gave me strength. When faced with a challenge, we can ask ourselves, how does this really affect me? Not my social status or my ego, but my essence. Your partner breaks up with you, you can't find a job, someone doesn't like you. None of this has the power to affect our inner state of being, our souls. If we take this realization a step further, we realize that not only do we have a soul or essence, but so does everyone around us. It's what unites humanity. When we realize this, we feel compassion toward others. The 13th century Persian po poet Sadi illustrates this idea in a poem that adorns one of the walls of the United Nations. Human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If you've no empathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. Awareness of this deep bond isn't always easy. How can we feel compassion for people who wrong us? One day I asked two of my cellmates this question. They're members of Iran's minority Baha'i faith. They're now serving 20-year prison sentences for practicing their religion. One of them had told me her father had been tortured in an Iranian prison years earlier, and shortly after he was released, he died. How can you not hate your captors, I asked them. You know what they said? We don't hate them, we forgive them. We feel love and compassion for all humanity, even for those who wrong us. We don't want to become like them. We hope God will help us show them a better way. Feeling compassion for all humanity motivates us to serve society, to influence the affairs of the world by touching other souls with our own. Concordia promotes compassion for others. That's why many of you have done community service like Habitat for Humanity, Teach for America, and so on. It's also part of the reason I'm free today, because when I couldn't come here to speak four years ago, my friend and mentor, Margot Melnikov, spoke in my place. And everywhere she, she looked, people were wearing red, uh, sorry, yellow ribbons on my behalf, and people were calling for my freedom. When I heard of this outpouring of support, I realized I wasn't alone. I didn't have to stand up to injustice by myself anymore. I believe efforts like these help pressure the Iranian authorities to overturn my eight-year prison sentence and free me after 100 days. Every voice, I realized, can make a difference. Today, nearly four years after I was freed and several years after I graduated from Concordia College, I'm still dis discovering how I can best influence the affairs of the world. Maybe you're asking yourselves the same question. Perhaps what I have discovered can help you find what's best for you. Service begins with consciousness of the soul or essence within us, which unites us with all humanity. If you look into the eyes of the person sitting next to you, go ahead, try it if you like, you can see a reflection of yourself. When we become aware, when we become aware of this bond, we feel compassion toward others, which helps us serve with a spirit of joy. And I've learned that the spirit in which service is rendered is more important than the form of the service itself. When we are fueled with the spirit of compassion, we can make a difference anywhere, through our careers or volunteer work, by being a voice for the voiceless, or simply by being a loving, family member or friend. Influencing the affairs of the world happens when we let our souls touch other souls. We can do this even in the most challenging situations if we choose an attitude of love, hope, and compassion over fear, despair, and hatred. This is what Concordia helped teach me, and I hope it will help you too as you set out to influence the affairs of the world. Congratulations. Concordia class of 2013, may your souls touch other souls.